Well, having been the winner of the 2008 Iowa caucus and participated as a candidate in two of them, my Monday and Tuesday was filled with wall-to-wall -wall media interviews, most of them focused on their bewilderment with the strong evangelical support for Donald Trump. They just don't get it and probably never will. But here goes. Evangelical voters do not vote in a monolithic block. There are many issues that drive our vote, not just having a candidate who can authentically quote scripture. Oh, granted, the two issues that are mostly non-negotiable for evangelicals are the sanctity of life issue and support for Israel. Even those don't get every evangelical supporter, but for most of us, those aren't political issues. Those are biblical issues. So we do tend to be steadfast on them. Evangelical voters don't vote on the person most like their pastor or Sunday school teacher. If a candidate truly and authentically shares the spiritual convictions and practices with voters, hey, that's great. But faith voters care about the same things most voters care about starting with a just, fair, and even-handed government that doesn't give special privileges to people of faith, but one which doesn't single them out for ridicule, scorn, and different treatment. When Barack Obama talked about people who cling to their guns in religion, or when Hillary Clinton spoke of conservative people being a basket of deplorables, or when Joe Biden and his Justice Department ended up branding parents domestic terrorists, you know, those who dare show up at school board meetings to ask for transparency and accountability from teachers and school officials, and who are paid with tax money. Yeah, evangelicals get the distinct feeling that Democrats have little respect or even tolerance for them or even their views. People of faith are said to be on the wrong side of history because they hold to biblical standards of marriage as being between one man and one woman, and because they believe that the scriptures declare that God created two genders, yep, just two, male and female. Trying to force Bible believers to use artificial pronouns for men pretending to be women, or women pretending to be men, is not just offensive to people of faith, it's immoral and it's insane. It makes no sense to tell us that we're on the wrong side of history when there is virtually no history at all of any civilized people ever accepting and promoting men marrying other men. In fact, the history of such is associated with such cultures as the fallen Roman or the fallen Greek empires as they embrace such things, are even more dramatically with a couple of ancient cities named Sodom and Gomorrah. That's not a side of history that most of us want to be on. Evangelicals believe in work as a means of earning the necessary resources to provide for and care for families. Most of us believe that real charity, we think that's what happens when we give a tithe of our income, 10%, to help widows, orphans, the homeless, and the hungry. We'd rather do it in the name of Jesus than have politicians exact the money from us and then have them distributed according to who might reciprocate those government gifts with votes. We take at its word the text of the First Amendment in which our founder said that the government shall not make any law that infringed upon the freedom of religion or speech. And when government starts making laws that in fact infringe on religious liberty or the right to believe or speak according to our consciences instead of government coercion, then yeah, evangelicals rightly resist in fact, demand adherence to the law instead of the having the demands of the left-wing lunatics insisting that we either believe as we're told or get systematically run out of business. Evangelicals want a government that will enforce laws, and that's whether the laws of immigration or the laws that prohibit violent attacks on innocent citizens or widespread theft and looting of businesses or even disrespect for police officers. Evangelicals want their children to live in a safe neighborhood where kids aren't targeted for fentanyl poisoning, sex trafficking, or pornography. We'd rather have an unrighteous person elected who respects and protects people of faith than one who proclaims to be righteous 
but who justifies the slaughter of unborn babies as a simple matter of personal choice, or someone who believes that parents ought to sit down and shut up when it comes to how their children are being taught in taxpayer-funded schools. You see, it's really quite simple. We believe moms and dads raise better kids than the government ever will. So when you hear the talking head commentators talking about the evangelical voters as if they understand who we are, be assured, those commentators, they don't know us. And they don't respect us. And they sure don't listen to us. But that's okay, because it's our goal to outvote those who defy biblical standards of life. And it's not just our right to do so. It is our responsibility. Well, Keith, it looks like you have found your snowshoes and you were able to get to the studio safely. We're grateful for that. Why don't you tell our audience what we have planned for the evening? And it's good. Well, actually, I sled in here. Radio Fire still works. Congressman Jim Jordan is next, and he's got some questions for the Treasury Department. Then later, Grammy winner Victory is here. You're watching Huckabee. MikeHuckabee.com and sign up for his free newsletter and follow AgGovMikeHuckabee on X. Jim Jordan has been serving in Congress since 2007. He was the founding chairman of the House Freedom Caucus. As the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee and a member of the Oversight Committee, the congressman is raising concerns over documents that claim the Treasury Department is surveilling private transactions and flagging merchant codes like MAGA and Trump as somehow being violent extremist indicators. And get this, also included were purchases of Bibles and small firearms. You can't make this stuff up. The Treasury Department so far has no explanation. To discuss all of this, please welcome back to the show one of our favorites, Congressman Jim Jordan. Congressman, I'm going to get right to this. This is just alarming, and you have sent a letter yep. uh, to the financial services uh, monitors, and you've asked them for accountability. But this is disturbing that American citizens were be surveilled because of what yeah. they purchase, as if that's any of the government's business. No, it's scary. Um, you know, financial surveillance is really what this is. You got banks uh, looking at the private transactions of their customers, uh, searching for key terms, all at the request of the government. Uh, and it looks like they did this without any, uh, any warrant or any legal process whatsoever. And they're almost like they're developing a profile of American citizens you know, my, you know, if you if you buy a Bible at the Christian bookstore, you buy a gun at Cabela's, and you use the you know you in in some of the correspondence with whoever you're buying something, you talk about Trump or MAGA, then they're going to profile you as some domestic violent extremist. And the scary thing is, you're, and we're just at the front end of this. But as you look at some of these documents, Governor, they they sound a lot like if you remember that memorandum from the Richmond Field Office of the FBI that we discovered a year ago where they were saying, if you're a pro-life Catholic, you're an extremist. It's, the, the language sounds so similar to what we saw in that government document. That's why we're pushing so hard to get answers to these questions. How extensive was this really? I, I'm just uh, stunned by this, that the government would think they could get away with it, but apparently they thought they could. But I want to make sure that our audience clearly understands what we're talking about. This is not suspicion of a criminal. This is not some suspicion that law enforcement has tagged and said this person uh, may be involved in a crime. This is surveillance of absolutely law-abiding citizens who go, as you say, yep. to a sporting goods store and maybe buy a rifle for hunting or a firearm for personal protection, doesn't matter, whatever they buy it for, or a Bible. Uh, and the government is surveilling their purchases by working with the bank card companies, whether it's Bank of America, whoever, finding out what those transactions are, and keeping a file. Congressman, this reminds me of East Germany and the Stasi, not the United States yeah. of America. What on earth can you guys do 
to put a stop to this. Yeah, and, and, and this all started when we had a whistleblower come forward and talk to us about an email, a correspondence between the government and Bank of America after the, the uh, riot on January 6th a few years back. And in that, in that email, they say, we want to know all debit and credit card purchases in, within a certain date time around January 6th. And then they wanted to overlay that with any, any gun purchase at any time as a way to develop a list of who they were going to look at. No, no reason, no predicate no, to, to criminally investigate these individuals. They were just looking for this information. So if you happen to be in you know, Washington, D.C. On, on January 6th of, of 2021, visiting a relative, and, and you use your debit card to, you know, pay for a hotel bill and you had a gun that you were on an FBI list, for goodness sake, according to this whistleblower. So this is where it started. We've now got some additional documents. But you're right, Governor, this is as scary as it gets. Financial surveillance of American citizens. And remember, this came on the, the, the past year in Congress. We did a, an extensive investigation into the censorship where you had big government, big tech big uh, media, big academia, all working together to censor Americans. Now we're looking at this financial surveillance issue and we got a lot of questions, a lot of information we got to get, but we're going to make sure we do. You're in a unique position because as chairman of the Judiciary Committee, this certainly deals with the constitutional rights of an American, First and Second Amendment, as well as Fourth and Fifth Amendment. So I mean, we're, we're covering sure. almost the entire Bill of Rights by these actions. Then as oversight uh, committee member, you're also looking at it from the standpoint of asking these federal agencies, what the heck are you guys doing? Who gave you the authority to do what you're doing? So I don't know of anybody in all of Congress who's in a more unique position because of the crossover of these two committees. And, uh, you know, I think on behalf of all the American people, we're saying, Congressman, go get them. I mean, our, our yeah. freedom is on the line. I, I want people to understand this is not a minor thing. Yeah. This is huge. Yeah. And, and because of some of the work we've done, uh, the, the committee's work we've done uh, this this first year of the Congress, uh, we've had some success. I mean, there's, there's constant attacks on your liberty and on Americans' freedom. But remember, the IRS announced four months ago that they will no longer be making unannounced visits to Americans' homes. And of course, the commissioner said, well, we're doing this because we're concerned about the safety of our agents. Baloney. They, they made this change because we caught them knocking on Matt Taibbi's door at the very time he was testifying in front of our committee. We also had the Department of Homeland Security announce that they were, they had this disinformation governance board as if some federal agency can determine what you're allowed to say and, and what you're not allowed to say. When we discovered this, the, Department of Homeland Security said we're getting rid of this board. So you got to you got to stay after this. But we have had some success when we expose this information, get it out there to the American people that these agencies change their behavior. That's what's got to happen here with the way the banks and government are interacting, profiling American citizens. How troubling is it to you that uh, for the past three years, the Biden administration has targeted private citizens, whether school board meetings and uh, domestic terrorist labels applied to parents because they chose to speak up for their kids? But here's yeah. the big issue. I'm hearing every day on the mainstream media that Donald Trump is going to be a dictator, that he's going to abuse government. He's going to go after retribution. In his four years, we never saw one single moment of him abusing his power as president, sicking the DOJ on anybody or any other agency. That's all we see from this administration. Yep. I mean, this election is, is really more than a Democrat versus a Republican. It's maybe freedom versus... Uh, dictatorship, and the dictatorship yeah. won't come at the hands of Donald Trump. No, great point. Uh, President Trump has a lot of great lines he uses when he's out talking. We were with him in Iowa uh, last week at a, at a rally. And, and off, uh, oftentimes he will, he will say, they're coming after me because I'm fighting for you. But he actually changed the line in Indianola, Iowa last week. He said, they're coming after my freedom because I'm fighting for yours. And the country understands it. In Iowa, I think the polling showed eight out of 10 Republican voters believe the government has been turned, weaponized against we the people, against the citizens they're supposed to serve. They think that because it's true. And they know President Trump is gonna fight to stop that. And as you point out, he didn't do that. The left does it. They've targeted, the DOJ said parents were terrorists. The FBI said pro-life Catholics are extremists. And now we see big government working with big banks, profiling America's purchasing uh, uh, choices and surveilling them in those, in those transactions. That is all frightening stuff. And it's why this election, as you, as you pointed out, is so darn important and that we gotta make sure, do everything we can to, to make sure President Trump uh, not only gets a nomination, which I think is, is definitely going to happen, but wins in November is our, and is our next president.
Another area where you're going to be involved very heavily is uh, looking at all the allegations of the Hunter Biden case, not about Hunter Biden, but about his connection to his father and the millions of dollars from the Chinese and yeah. oligarchs from Ukraine and Russia. Hunter Biden has now agreed he's going to come in and sit for uh, closed door depositions. How big a deal is it that he's finally accepted the subpoena from Congress? Well, no, we think it's important because it's a sequence of people we need to talk to before we make a decision on whether we're going to move forward with articles of impeachment or not. We have uh, Rob Walker next week who we're talking to, who is one of Hunter Biden's business partners. We're going to talk with Eric Schwerer and another one of his business partners the week after that. The week after that is Tony Bobulinski. Then we got Jim Biden who is scheduled. Uh, we're scheduling him. And then we got Hunter Biden who's coming in at the end of February. So we got to work through those. And I think the case is already pretty darn compelling. But we need to talk to these final witnesses and then make a decision. Do we actually file articles of impeachment against President Biden. And we'll, the conference, will, the Republicans and the, and the House of Representatives will make that decision once we've received all the evidence. And you've got a big budget issue coming up. I know uh, that's also controversial for a lot of the Republicans. Will there be a budget deal? And should there be, given the terms that uh, are being put on the table? Well, um, look, uh, there was a, you know, a continual resolution passed uh, this, this week uh, we'll see how it all shakes out. What I what I do know is we got a we got a FISA reform that needs to happen to protect Americans' liberties. Uh, we got this issue of, of securing the border, which I think is of paramount importance that we got to get done. So we're going to focus on all those issues under the leadership of Speaker Johnson. Congressman, we always love having you. Hope to have you back in uh, the studio in Nashville soon. Our thanks for uh, doing the important work of oversight that you're doing in Congress. And uh, we also want to remind our audience, if you'd like to keep up with the developments of all of these issues and with Congressman Jordan's work on Capitol Hill, if you go to Huckabee.tv, follow the links, we will get you directly connected. Right now, Keith Bilbrey is going to tell all of us what we've got coming up next on the show. After the break, country music star Granger Smith gives up country music for the ministry. Then stay with us because Senator Josh Hawley is right after that. Don't go away. Nobody knows when disaster might strike, and the results can be truly devastating. Our friends at Samaritan's Purse work tirelessly around the clock to help people and to help cities all over the world who are found to be victims of these catastrophes. Samaritan's Purse provides medical supplies, food, cleanup, and so much more, as well as providing the love of Jesus Christ in the midst of these disasters. And it wouldn't be possible without your generous giving. So thank you for that. And if you haven't yet, go to Samaritan's Purse website or call them today to give what God has placed on your heart. Thanks, and God bless. Granger Smith enjoyed years of stardom as a platinum-selling country singer-songwriter with hits like Backroad Song and If the Boot Fits. Then in 2019, he lost his three-year-old son, River, in a tragic swimming pool accident. It became the catalyst for a major life change, with Granger walking away from a successful career in the music business and turning to ministry. He's now sharing his story to help others who are struggling with grief and loss with an inspiring book, Like a River. We welcome to the show, Granger Smith. Granger, I'm so delighted to have you, but it's not a delight to talk about what was the catalyst for moving you from an incredible music career to one of ministry. Tell us what happened. You know, when we lost River, I was there. Uh, that, that's the, that's my, my son's name. I was there in the backyard with him. And I was with my daughter. We were playing gymnastics. And my two sons, Lincoln and River, were playing water gun fight. And I remember thinking, soak in this moment because these days won't last forever. Things were good. Things were good in my life. Things were good in my career, in my family. And probably 60 seconds went by since the last time I saw River and I noticed it was quiet and I turned over my left shoulder and, and there he was in the pool face down. I think you said it very well. That was the catalyst to truly my own death. And the book, like a river, it, people say, oh, that book's about losing your son. It's, 
that's just the first chapter. That's just how it begins because it was the beginning of a new life for me completely. It, it must have been uh, not an event, but a process to go from that moment where you lose your son. And I know that you and your wife made a very tough decision, but one that saved the lives of other children when you agreed to allow his organs to be harvested for life-saving uh, opportunities for others. There has to be some sense of, of knowing that your son is living on in the lives of children that otherwise wouldn't have be, been alive today had it not been for that important decision you made. That's a very interesting piece of my story. And, and by God's grace, really, my wife brought it up. And, and to this day, she says she doesn't know where that came from or why she decided to donate his organs. But that came in a moment when we needed to decide when to turn off the breathing machine. There was no chance of his survival. When could we tell the doctors that we needed to unplug the machine? Well, Amber comes in, my wife, and she threw a curveball and she said, we want to donate his organs. But something interesting happened in that moment because in this moment for me and our family, the, the worst day, the worst day ever, Lord willing, maybe the worst day I'll ever experience. And the darkest of times, suddenly there was this tiny ray of light, a, a tiny a tiny piece of good in all bad. And so in hindsight, I look back and I go, you know what? What's crazy about the darkest day for me is that even in the darkest day, there is good. And for our worst day, our worst nightmare for someone else, it was a day of a miracle. It was an answer to a prayer. And, and that was something was working in me with that. Something was working that if God is good and he's working everything towards a greater good for his greater glory, then everything we look at must have a purpose and a reason, even when we cannot see it. I know that there were moments of darkness even after that. And I think for a lot of times when believers are going through the, the toughest times, there are moments of uh, extraordinary heights and extraordinary lows. There were lows in your life, even as you continued your music career back on the road three weeks after River's death. And then there was times when you weren't sure you wanted to keep living. And I think that's an encouraging word from your book, because in the book, Like a River, you don't paint it as, oh, well, you just say a prayer and everything was great and you never looked back. It was a struggle and it was an ongoing battle to, to come to the place of acceptance and and being able to move forward and let God call you to something new. Talk about that struggle and how valuable that was in ultimately getting to the place where you surrendered all and said, whatever, Lord, I'll do it. Yes, sir. That, probably the most important part of my testimony in hindsight is looking back and, and thinking, you know, I grew up in a Christian home, faithful parents. We went to church, youth group and youth camps and was baptized and and part of FCA and uh, could articulate the gospel, prayed before meals. But then I realized in, in the toughest of times for me, during the darkest day, I wasn't relying on God. I was relying on myself. And really, that was the first indication, as especially as I look back now, that was the first indication that I was relying on myself, and that was my religion. Self-help was my religion. Now, I, I leaned on what I call now a cultural, a, a nominal Christianity. I called it in the book, dog tag Christianity. It's like when soldiers put the, the religion on their dog tags in World War II, just so you know what kind of priest is there for the funeral. But th there's really nothing mm -hmm. deeper than that. And I realized as, as I needed to lean on something and I leaned on myself, and like you said, things got darker and worse and worse for me as I tried my hardest to heal myself, to forgive myself for guilt that I had for being in the backyard that day. And although the culture says we need to forgive ourselves and we're not guilty people, the Bible says, regardless of, of what we call it, shame or scars, the Bible says we're sinners and we are guilty. And the gospel says, Jesus says, I have come, you believe in me, I have come to forgive you. I have come to wash you clean. And that is something I did not know before I had to go through the darkest days to realize that. 
I think one of the most powerful parts of your story is that you decided to leave a very successful music career. Were there people who said, Granger, you've lost your mind. You, you've got everything going for you. You need to stay with your music career. Don't give it all up and go into full-time ministry. But you did anyway. Yes, sir. Uh, people absolutely said that. They said, uh, oh, Granger, he, he lost his son and poor guy. He's just now he's just going crazy. You know, he, he found his religion and, and that's what he's going to do. Don't ruin this, Granger. You know, don't ruin a good thing. You, if you want to talk about Jesus, you've got a great platform. Get on the stage and and these sold out crowds and tell them about Jesus. Then go back to what you do and sing that country music. You know, I got that all the time. And and, and to be honest, I, I understand that sentiment. I, I, I understand that mentality. But this is something I struggled with. Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And I realized. I wasn't denying myself in country music. I was exalting myself. I needed attention. I, I craved praise for myself. And I couldn't reconcile that with the new life I was given. After the darkest days that happened to me, and after I was given new life and a new chance, I wanted to tell everybody that from a place where I was exalting him and glorifying him alone and not myself. Well, it's a beautiful story. It's it's like Simon Peter leaving his nets behind and a career of fishing uh, to follow Jesus. And for you, uh, your nets were your uh, guitar and musical career. But I think a lot of us uh, are grateful for the extraordinary ministry you have, and we are just delighted to have you with us today. I want to say to our audience, you can find Granger Smith's book, Like a River, as well as his music, podcasts, speaking appearances, and a whole lot more at Huckabee.tv. I have a feeling you'll want to invite him to your church or community, but be sure to get the book. It is a very powerful, inspiring story. Now, we may be snowed in, but we still have a blizzard of entertainment for you, and Keith Bilbrey is about to tell you what's coming up next. Up next, Missouri Senator Josh Hawley with an update on the immigration crisis. And later, victory performed. Bundle up, more Huckabee is on the way. My next guest is a staunch defender of the Constitution and a great friend to this program. He was just with us not too long ago. He's a nationally recognized constitutional law scholar who served as his state's attorney general. Now he's standing up as one of the few conservative firebrands we've got serving in the U.S. Senate. Please welcome back to the show, Missouri Senator Josh Hawley. Senator, great to have you back, and uh, I hope you are enjoying your time in, as I like to say, doing the Lord's work in the devil's town. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm doing my best. It is a privilege to be here, though, Mike. It's a privilege to serve the Lord anywhere. And as you and I have talked about, uh, this, is, uh, this is the place where my wife and I feel he's called us now. And so it's a privilege to be here. This week, you penned a letter to the Secretary of Homeland Security. You have asked for information and details about a $700,000 amount of money uh, that has been designated basically to attack conservatives. Tell us what's going on with that, what you're asking for, but more importantly, what are they doing with our money? Yeah, here's the deal. Now, as it turns out, just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, they are literally paying people to come up with propaganda to use against conservatives. And I don't just use that word propaganda lightly. That's their word. They have awarded grants. Homeland Security has awarded grants to liberal academics to create propaganda to use against conservatives on issues from immigration to COVID to vaccine questions. I mean, this is really unbelievable stuff. So here's the bottom line. If you're conservative and you're out there saying, hey, I don't think the border ought to be open, your government is paying somebody to try and shut you down. I mean, this is almost too beyond my belief to accept this other than you've got the facts and you've looked at it. But my first reaction is, no, the government would never do anything that stupid 
that blatantly political with taxpayer money and that overtly partisan. And what you're saying to us is they are not planning on doing it. They're doing it. They're actually using our have, own money to talk against us and to try to destroy us. They have awarded the grants. And we know that hundreds of thousands of dollars in various grants. And so when you put it all together, millions of dollars of your money, taxpayer money, has gone to fund what they call counter propaganda. I mean, imagine your own government treating you as someone who needs to be propagandized, who needs to be corrected, uh, who needs to have money spent against you so that your views can be properly educated and formed and drowned out if necessary. So here's what I've said. I want to get every dime accounted for. I want to know from Homeland Security where all the money has gone, what other grants they've awarded, who has gotten the money and what they're using it for. But Mike, I'll just tell you, this is yet another reason why the Homeland Security Secretary, Mayorkas, he needs to go. This is a guy who's deliberately refusing to enforce our border laws, and now he is spending our money against us for propaganda. Well, and you bring up some of the things that he's done with the propaganda. Just uh, this week, Dave Rubin, a well-known uh, commentator, posted on social media that he was standing in a TSA line. He took a photograph, so he has documentation of it. And it says that if you are a, quote, migrant, you don't have to have ID and they would like for you to simply come and show whatever card you were given at the border, and being photographed is optional. Basically, it's this. As a U.S. citizen, I have to show up at the airport to get on a plane. I've got to have a photo ID or a passport. I have to show it to them. I have to be willing to be bodily searched in order to get on an airplane. If I'm an illegal, I'm told all I got to do is show up, wave at them, if I don't want my picture taken, I don't have to. And I can just go ahead and get on that plane with all the U.S. citizens who are paying taxes so this guy can fly for free. Help me understand what the heck is that about, Senator? Well, I tell you what it's about. It's concierge service for illegal immigrants. And they're doing it at airports. Uh, they're doing it at the border. Did you know that you can get an app now? The U.S. government has an app for a phone that if you're an illegal immigrant or you want to be, you can get an app, you can download it, and you can schedule your time to show up and illegally claim asylum and then just get into the country. I mean, literally, they will facilitate it. They'll, they'll put you at the front of the illegal line. You can go schedule it online with the app. Then, of course, they'll fly you around and use taxpayer money to do that. And then the, it, to add insult to injury, if you, you know, need to go to the hospital, you have a problem, they'll take a law enforcement agent off of trying to track down drugs off of child exploitation cases. They're sending them to the border to take illegal immigrants to doctor's appointments, uh, to run other errands. And I know this for a fact because these law enforcement agents have come to me. They've come to me and said, we are getting pulled off of our cases. We're getting pulled off of child exploitation cases to go down to the border and to babysit, that's their word, babysit illegal immigrants. I mean, this is, this is out of control. And all I can say is, this is what the Biden administration thinks of you and thinks of our laws. They do not care. And, and Senator, when I'm thinking how this is playing out, uh, there are people, even a few Republicans, they're never Trumpers. They say, I, I don't want to vote for Donald Trump. I'll vote for Joe Biden. When they say that, they're voting against the secure border that we had when President Trump was in office. And they're voting for these policies in which 7 million, 10 million, we don't even know the number, have illegally crossed the border. We have no idea where they're from, although we do know that people have come from 170 countries. It's not just from South and Central America. And people need to know that they are supporting policies that are not in their best interest as U.S. citizens for their safety, security, for drug uh, dealing going across the border, or for sex trafficking. How do we wake these folks up? Yeah. Well, I would I would just say this, you know, just take my home state of Missouri. I mean, we're not a border state geographically, obviously, but the amount of drugs that is pouring into my state and into every school district and every school yard in the state of Missouri, where are they coming from? Across the border. I mean, so you point out, you're right, a vote for Joe Biden, sadly, is a vote to keep that drug flow coming. A vote for Joe Biden is a vote to allow the cartels to do whatever they want at our border. It is a vote to destroy our sovereignty, where we don't even have a sovereign border anymore. The only borders that the liberals care about are in Ukraine. 
Our own borders, hey, just open them up, wide open. The only economy that the liberals seem to care about is China's economy. As we spend all this Green New Deal money helping them build up their economy and make America's poor, make American economy, the American economy poorer, worse, weaker. I mean, this is the Joe Biden agenda. Senator, before I let you go, I want you to uh, speak to the case that is going to the Supreme Court. Uh, you've been an attorney general. Uh, you're known as someone who is well-versed in the Constitution. These states that are trying to throw Donald Trump off the ballot based on Section 3 of uh, the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, I mean, is there any true legal constitutional basis to take a presidential candidate off the ballot for something he's never been even charged with, much less convicted of? Zero basis. I mean, zero basis. And I think, Mike, it just shows you how far the radical left is willing to go. Now they don't want people to vote. They don't even want people to have the option. They don't want you to even be able to cast the ballot. Forget about counting it correctly. They don't even want you to cast it. They're literally taking Trump off ballots, and there's no constitutional justification for it. And there'll be no stopping this. There'll be no end to it, rather, if, if they're allowed to go forward. I mean, what's going to happen next is Republican states will say, well, fine, you don't want Trump on the ballot. I don't want Biden on the ballot. And, and uh, every court or every state official will say, oh, well, you know, if you're going to call Trump an insurrectionist, then I think that uh, this Democrat over here for this office, they shouldn't be on the ballot. And there'll be no principled reason to deny them the ability to do that. I mean, we've got to obey the law. And the law says that if you qualify for the ballot as Trump has, then the voters get to decide and the courts stay out of it. We call that democracy. But I think what the liberals are trying to do, it's what they've been trying to do for years, Mike, and now they've just finally made it glaringly obvious. All of these cases against Trump, all of these prosecutions, they've all been about keeping him off the ballot. They haven't been able to do it. And so now they're just cutting straight to the chase and saying, you know what, fine, let's just, we'll just do it ourselves. We'll just take him right off the ballot ourselves. It is so unconstitutional and so dangerous. And so very disturbing. Senator, it's always a pleasure to have you. Look forward to your next visit with us and uh, stay safe and keep uh, the good work going up there. Thank you for having me. You can keep up with Senator Hawley and the wonderful work that he's doing to keep our border secure. Just go to our website. It's Huckabee.tv. We've got links to follow and support the senator. Right now, Keith Bilbrey, I know we got something special coming up. We're gonna let you tell us all about it right now. We do indeed, Governor. Inspirational gospel singer Victory is with us next on Huckabee. TV and get your very own Made in the USA Huckabee mugs, t-shirts, and more. Well, welcome back. We hope you've had a wonderful time with tonight's show. And as you know, We've had to do things a little differently because of all the weather systems that have been happening all over the country. But you know what we didn't have to do? We didn't have to bring in another band because we have the best band in all of television on our show, and they came in and gave us some great music all night long. Trey Corley and the Music City Connection. Tonight's musical guests, well, she's been singing since she was four years old with the Boys and Girls Choir of Detroit, where her dad founded that particular group, and then with her family's Christian group, Infinity Song. She was discovered and signed to Jay-Z's label when she was busking on the streets of New York. And she won a Grammy for her lyrics on Kanye West's debut gospel album. And by the way, she beat Trey Corley to do that. Her latest release is her first solo gospel album. It's called Glory Hour. So very pleased to welcome to the show, Victory. Victory, thank you for coming. Delighted to have you with us. Thanks for having me. I want to talk about the fact you got started early, four years old, singing with your family. I mean, your family's obviously very musical. 
but you apparently took to it at a very early age, didn't have the kind of stage fright that most kids would have. <laughs> so this just seems to come right out of your DNA. Well, you know, it's kind of like reverse psychology. You know, they tell you you can't do something and then suddenly you make it your business to do everything in your power to do the thing that they said you couldn't do. And so as a four-year-old, obviously, they're like, you're a baby. You can't get on stage and sing with the rest of the kids. And I said, yes, I can. And I, I, I did everything within <laughs> my power to prove everyone wrong. And, and my parents gave me a shot at singing. And I, um, I'd never let them down. And I, I always looked at singing as, as a privilege, not a right. And because we have this privilege, we must always exercise this privilege to sing. And so that was my start in music. You know, it's pretty amazing. You've worked with Jay-Z, you've worked with Kanye, you get a Grammy for the work you did with Kanye West and his gospel album. What's next for you? I mean, it, it looks like wherever the top is, that's where you're headed. <laughs> well, um, I, I've just released this album entitled Glory Hour. And, you know, I thought I would have to be world-renowned famous to proclaim the gospel from the from the secular music industry, um, because my um, my route was unconventional. I I didn't uh, get signed to a Christian label. I was signed as a Christian by by Jay Z. And um, I at first, you know, I, I created music that was more like parables, stories that referenced the kingdom and told principles of the kingdom. And uh, and then when I did this work with Kanye, it was like I was able to fully write about the power of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, and, and all of the uh, most potent aspects of my faith unashamedly. And, you know, after that, I wanted, I saw that it could be done because that album was released in the secular space and you had everyone of every kind of religion, every kind of belief system singing these lyrics to Jesus is King. And, um, and so my, my thinking was, well, I've seen that it could be done. Why not, why not continue with what we started? And even though Kanye went in a different direction, my thinking was uh, we, can, we can still continue this, this mandate that Jesus gave us really to, to take the gospel to all corners of the world. And, and the way that I do that is through music. And so I, my, my goal is to continue to um, share. Uh, <clears throat> And it's not just about sharing my religion. It's really sharing my experience at life. And um, there's, the, there's the bad, there's the struggles, and then there's, there's the glory. And the glory, I, I use glory to describe the resurrecting power of Jesus. And, and so whenever I find myself in hardships, I, I always write about the hardships, but I always wait for the glory. And Jesus never fails to reveal himself in, in hardships. And so... With this album, that's what I wanted to encourage people to wait for glory hour. Like when you find yourself in moments of darkness, simply put your hope in the hope of glory. And I promise you, uh, the hope of glory will not fail you. And the Bible describes Jesus as the hope of glory. And so that's my message and that's what I'm here to spread.